we are on week three of our Jesus Said sermon series. We've had Jesus Said, let's party. And we've had Jesus Said, everyone welcome. And today we've got Jesus Said, let's go for a drink. I'm keen for that. Um, So when I say to someone, let's go for a drink, what I'm actually saying is, let's hang out, let's catch up, let's chat, let's put the world to right, let's go for a drink. And in Jesus' time, there was a similar phrase, it's slightly different, but it meant the same thing. And that was, can I have a drink? Or give me a drink. That might sound quite demanding if we say to someone today, give me a drink. Doesn't sound great, does it? Uh, They probably roll their eyes at you. But back in Jesus' time, in that language, that's what the phrase was. Give me a drink. Let's chat. Let's be friends. And now Jesus ate and drank a lot throughout his life. on on earth and with hundreds of people and like we heard he feasted and he partied but there's a particular encounter when he says to someone give me a drink let's go for a drink let's chat I want to get to know you the life of Jesus is split into four books in the Bible Matthew Mark Luke and John and I teach this in school sometimes and what I say to the kids is it's like imagine if your whole class goes to a party and then you come into school the next day and your teacher says write down what happened at the party no one's going to write exactly the same thing it's all going to be slightly different even though you're at the same event and that's kind of in its simplest form what the gospels are four different men's opinions of pretty much the same stuff Um, and today we're going to be looking at what John said and what John experienced in the life of Jesus chapter four is where we are, and it tells us that the Jewish religious leaders were giving Jesus a bit of a hard time in the city of Jerusalem, and he decides that actually it would be way safer for him if he left the city of Jerusalem and travelled north up to Galilee. So to get there, he's up for this long journey, but he's got to go through Samaritan territory. Uh, Verse 5 says, Jesus arrived at the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph long ago. Now Google Maps, I put it in, tells me that the village of Sychar, which is named something else now, is about 75 kilometres north of Jerusalem. That's a long walk isn't it? And Google also tells me that on modern tarmac roads, you could walk it in about 16 hours. It's a long walk. And it's a hot walk. It's a hot place. And that's on modern roads, not the dusty, sandy roads that Jesus would have been trekking through back then. No wonder that the Bible tells us he is wearied by his long journey. And he sits on the edge of Jacob's well. He's tired, He sent his disciples into the village to buy food, for it was already afternoon. He's tired and he's hungry. They've missed lunch. So he sends his disciples off to go and get some food. And I love that it tells us that because it shows us his humanity. It shows us that he was still very much human and experienced and suffered in the way that we suffer hunger. He was there too. It says, soon though, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Give me a drink of water. Let's chat. I want to get to know you. Surprised, she said, why would a Jewish man ask a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? Why would a Jewish man ask a Samaritan woman? Why do you want to chat to me? We know that there was ongoing hatred between the Jews and Samaritans that dates back hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, almost a thousand years before Jesus, it began. And that was because the the Assyrian Empire was expanding. I think there's a map to go with this. Um, Israel was divided into the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And the northern kingdom was first taken over by the Assyrian Empire. And that included the region of Samaria. And to keep control over that area, the Assyrians deported some of the Jews from northern Israel and sent them back to their native land. And at the same time, they imported some of their native Assyrians into the northern kingdom of Israel. And over the years, what happened was those two races, they lived alongside one another, they were friends, they married one another, and they reproduced a mixed race generation. Fine. Not for the southern Jews. The southern Jews hated the northern Jews for betraying their pure bloodline, for betraying their race, their people, and their nation. So there was extreme racism between the Jews of Jerusalem and the Jews of Samaria. The Samaritans were hated. Why would a Jewish man ask a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? Not only was she a member of the hated mixed race, but she was a woman. And we know that women were of 
no value at this time. And I did a bit of research, and I found that at the time of Jesus, there was actually a huge shortage of women in this part of the world. There were about 140 men for every 100 women, simply because that if you were born a girl, you were very likely just to be left to die at birth. In the Roman Empire, there was a law in place that said if you had a boy, you had to raise all of your healthy male children. But if you had a girl, you only had to raise the first one. Then you could discard the rest. So they were low on women. If you lived, you got a very little or no education. You were classified as a child, no matter how old you are, and you were always the property of a man. They were married off as soon as they hit puberty, sometimes before. And they were often taken advantage of because they were children. And if a wife, and I find this just unbelievable, if a wife was violated by another man, the husband of that wife was legally obliged to divorce her, which would leave her with nothing, literally penniless on the street. And she's the one that's been attacked. She's the one that's been abused. And the, the woman... The woman is kicked out, the man, the husband is compensated and, and freed from this woman that's brought shame on him. That is the, the world that this Samaritan woman is living in. And this conversation that Jesus is having, or about to have with this woman, is the longest recorded conversation of any conversation between Jesus and any other person in the Bible, the longest and it's with a woman, and a Samaritan woman, and I don't believe that that's an accident. I think God did that on purpose. And she was a woman alone and fetching water in the middle of the day. So the fact she's fetching her own water tells us she's poor because she hasn't got a servant to do it for her. And most women would fetch water together. It was like a social activity. In the morning and at night, they'd go down, have a good chat, catch up, have a gossip, and get their water and take it home. But this woman is on her own in the middle of the day when it's the hottest point. Doesn't really make much sense. She's not wanted. Something about her means she's not welcome with the other women. They don't want her in their group. And Jesus knows this. Jesus replied, verse 10, If you only knew who I am and the gift that God wants to give you, you'd ask me for a drink and I'd give you living water. That's a weird phrase, living water. Not one we often use. <laughs> But as Christians, uh, we believe that many of our physical needs have spiritual parallels. So in the same way that our physical body needs food and water and nutrients to, to survive, but more than to survive, to thrive and to live, uh, Jesus taught that actually our souls need that nutrients too. Spiritual food, spiritual water. I work in schools all over Bristol, and there are a lot of schools that are implementing mindfulness and meditation in the classroom, and I know workplaces and offices are too, because the children are having to learn to sit still. Children are, need to learn to find peace in stillness. And so do adults, I do. <laughs> but we can't sit still, can we? we? We're a bit of a restless generation, we're anxious, we're overwhelmed, we're having panic attacks. And when we st sit still without being distracted, without a screen, without a TV, without an audiobook, we are reminded of all those things in our life that overwhelm us and that just pile up. We're f when we sit still, we're free to, to worry. And that feels... I believe, deep within us. I think it's more than just a head thing. I believe that is a spiritual thing that happens deep in our soul. And, when we, and so what we do is we just keep going. We don't stop. We keep distracting ourselves and searching for something else to distract us from all those things. And I believe, personally, that this is what happens to us when we don't feed our soul with what it actually needs, when we don't look after our soul, when we're too busy, when we don't rest. And partly of that, partly is this is because... I think we starve it of the spiritual food and the spiritual nutrients that we can only get through spending time with God, through knowing God and sitting in his presence, through just chatting to him and listening to him. And he offers the Samaritan woman this, this living water to feed her soul, but she doesn't get it. She doesn't understand. The woman replied, but sir, you don't even have a bucket. And this well is very deep. Where do you find this living water? How are you going to do it? You don't even have a bucket. What are you talking about? Do you really think that you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who dug this well and drank from it himself along with all of his children and his livestock? Jesus answered, If you drink from Jacob's well, if you drink this well, you'll be thirsty again and again. You'll have to come back tomorrow and the next day and keep getting water. 
But if anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never thirst again and will be forever satisfied. Because when you drink the water I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit, springing up and flooding you with endless life. A gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit, flooding you with endless life. So the Holy Spirit is that part of God that will come and live within you when you become a Christian, when you choose to believe in Jesus. And Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as being a helper or a comforter. It's a bit like having God really, really close to you every day, in your everyday life. And he gives you, we believe he gives you exactly what you need to overcome every day and to survive and to thrive every day. Strength, courage, joy, hope. If, if we let him into that. And Jesus is saying that when you experience that, what that feels like, to be close to God, to be filled, to have hope that there's more to life than this, then you will be completely satisfied. That's living water. You'll just know in your heart and in your mind and in your soul that God is absolutely everything that you need. The woman replied, Let me drink that water so I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come back here to draw water. She is getting there, isn't she? She's slowly getting there, but really she just thinks that there's some magical water that means she doesn't have to come back to the well every day on her own in the sun. Jesus, though, has got her attention because she thinks he can make life easier for her. So she's listening. Jesus says, out of the blue, change of subject, Go get your husband and bring him back here. (laughs) What? (laughs) But I'm not married, the woman answered. That's true, Jesus said. For you've been married five times, and now you're living with a man who's not your husband. You've told the truth. This is the point where I've heard many preachers label this woman as being sexually immoral or unfaithful, married five times, living with someone that's not her husband. But we know now that divorce was actually incredibly uncommon at the time of Jesus. And when it did take place, only a man could initiate it. Patriarchal society, this woman is at the, is at the mercy of men. And it's likely that actually at least one of these husbands has died and she's been left destitute and had to do something to get herself out of this situation. We do not know the circumstance, but what we do know is that this woman has had a difficult and a desperate life. Her current situation probably isn't actually about casually sleeping around. Actually, at this time, if if a man wanted a woman of a lower class, and we know she's poor because she was getting her own water, he could bring her into his pre-existing marriage as a second wife. And this was probably actually her only way of surviving at this time, relying on a man. But, and this is the thing, even if she was an unfaithful wife, even if she had lived a life of adultery, I believe that Jesus would have had the exact same conversation with her. Because as Dave preached last week, Jesus welcomes everyone. No matter the guilt or the shame or the sin that you feel you have committed, he welcomes us all the same. The conversation is the same. He still will offer you a drink of water. And the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me this. Why do our fathers worship God here on this nearby mountain, but your people teach that Jerusalem is the place we must worship? Which is right. What she's done here is what we often do, isn't it? When God challenges our lifestyle choices or our decisions, we kind of run away slightly. She has deflected. This man has highlighted the mess in her life, the pain in her life, and she doesn't want to talk about it, understandably. She's acknowledged he's right, She's admitted it, you must be a prophet, she said it, but then she tries to change the subject. It's almost like it's a bit too close to home. She doesn't know this man, why would she trust this man? Why would she trust a Jewish man from the south? She's known a lot of men in her life. She's been let down by a lot of men, how is this one any different? So she distracts him by trying to engage in a theological debate. And he knows He knows this woman. He knows that this woman is a victim of a patriarchal society. He knows she's unwelcome in her own neighborhood. He understands why she's in the situation she's in. He knows all the trauma that has led her to this point that she's in. And he wants to free her from all of it. But she doesn't know that. He's just another man, a random stranger at the well, asking her for a drink. Of course, she's going to change the subject. 
So tell me this, why do our fathers worship God here on this mountain, but your people teach Jerusalem is the place we must worship, which is right? Jesus responded, believe me, dear woman, dear woman, that's that compassion for this woman, believe me, dear woman, the time has come when you won't worship the Father on a mountain or in Jerusalem, but in your heart. He's clever, isn't he? He's taken a theological issue, she tried to distract him, and he's brought it back to matters of the heart, her heart, because actually that's what he's interested in. He's interested in her heart. He wants to transform this woman's heart and give her a new hope and freedom from her shame and her past. From here on, worshipping the Father will not be a matter of the right place, but with the right heart. For God is a spirit. He's everywhere. He's not just on the mountain. He's not in the temple. He's everywhere. And he longs to have sincere worshippers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and in truth. So through, through this theological discussion, he's saying it's not about religious rituals or the place that you worship. It's more than that. It's about the state of your heart. Does your heart put God first? Do you choose him above everything else? Because that's what sincere worship is, putting God first. And that's what he's looking for in his followers. And the woman said, bless her. (laughs) I don't get it. This is all so confusing. But I do know that the anointed one is coming, the true Messiah. And when he comes, he will tell us everything we need to know. We know the Samaritans are of Jewish heritage, and just like the Jews were waiting for a saviour, so are the Samaritans. They're expecting God to save them, um, send them someone to save them from the Roman occupation, among other things. Jesus said to her, you don't have to wait any longer. The anointed one is here speaking with you. I am the one you're looking for. It's me. At that moment, perfect timing, as always, the disciples returned and were stunned to see Jesus speaking with a Samaritan woman. Stunned. He should not be speaking with a Samaritan, certainly not a Samaritan woman, in public in the middle of the day. Yet none of them, none of them dared to ask him what or why they were discussing. All at once, the woman dropped her water jar and ran off to her village and told everyone. Come and meet a man at the well who's told me everything I've ever done. He could be the anointed one we've been waiting for. Dropped dropped her water jar, ran to the village and told everyone. Um, Quick story. I uh, have told this before, so I apologise if you've heard it, but it's relevant, so I'm going to share it. Uh, I had my first drink with Jesus when I was 11. Um, And uh, it's the first time I really felt that gushing Holy Spirit, that fountain, that that um, water, that living water. Um, and I had a very similar experience to this woman, and I'm not saying this is what happens to everyone, um, but it's what happened to me. I was in a Christian event. Um, I'd asked to be filled with the Spirit of God, and I felt just this overwhelming sense of love and undeserved love. It was like I knew how imperfect I was and all those bad things about me, but I knew that God loved me anyway, and I knew I was forgiven for all those things, and I knew I was free. And as an 11-year-old kid, I just wanted the world to know. So I got up and I left. I ran out. My mom must have freaked, but I I just ran out and I had to tell everyone. We were in London, no, in North Wales, and I ran down the front... um, high street and all the way to the end of the pier and I told everybody that Jesus loved them because I was just completely overwhelmed by this and that is what's happened to this woman she didn't care whether she looked stupid or what everyone thought of her she just knew she got something real and she wanted everybody to have it too and this woman had had one conversation with Jesus and her entire being her soul was fed and watered one conversation She didn't even take a drink from the well. She dropped her water jar and ran to the village. And she told everyone. This woman was an outsider in her own community. She was alone and she was shamed. And a short chat with Jesus and she's a new person with the boldness and the courage to go and tell everyone. Every person. These aren't her friends. These are people that have rejected her, gossiped about her, taunted her, labelled her, laughed at her, ignored her. And she still went and told them who Jesus was. She was that excited and that convinced and that changed. She saved these people these people who had rejected her by introducing them to Jesus. And they met him. It says, hearing this, the people came streaming out of the village to see Jesus. They listened to her, maybe because they could see that she was different. 
Because when you've been in the presence of God, you are different, aren't you? You're never the same again. A few minutes with Jesus and she is completely transformed. And simply through talking and listening, he told her that she was worth something, that her opinions and her ideas mattered, that he cared about her and what she thought. He took her seriously and treated her as an individual, as though she had her own identity, which women did not. Women were defined by the man in their life, and he changed that. He treated her as though she was her own person, not a possession, not defined by a man. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, Jesus gave women human dignity. Jesus gave women human dignity. Prior to Jesus, women were regarded as inferior beings, religiously speaking. I was saying earlier, I could do a whole sermon on how Jesus changed women and how Jesus changed life for women and how Jesus began almost like a revolution of how women should be treated in society. But I won't. But the point is, (laughs) he changed this woman's life. He treated her in a way that no other man had ever treated her before and will ever treat her again. He got her attention. The Bible tells us that after this whole encounter, the villagers come out, they meet Jesus. Loads of them, loads of them become believers and followers of Christ. And they head back into the village. It says... The disciples began to insist that Jesus eat some food. Because remember, he sent them off to get them lunch because he was hungry. And they said to him, teacher, you must eat something. You must be starving. But Jesus told them, don't worry about me. I've eaten a meal that you don't know about. And I love this. This wasn't actually, this verse wasn't in the passage that Dave gave to me, but it was just like the next bit and I thought I had to include it. It says, Jesus said, don't worry about me. I've eaten a meal you don't know about. Both the woman and Jesus came to the well in need of food and water. Neither of them ate anything physical. (laughs) Nobody drank, nobody ate, yet both left satisfied, filled. The woman drank that living water that Jesus offered, and she was satisfied that just by being in his presence, just by sitting next to him, just by chatting, she left filled. Jesus drank in the woman's devotion to him and was equally satisfied. I've eaten a meal you don't know about. God is satisfied, filled when we give our lives to him, when we pay attention to him, when we sit and have a drink with him. How incredible is that? That spending time with us is what satisfies and what fills God. He loves us that much. And to all of us, those of us maybe like me who had your drink, first drink with Jesus a while ago, it might have been decades, he still says to you today, give me a drink, chat to me, tell me about it, spend time with me, give me your life, let's go for a drink, but I will satisfy you actually. I will make you whole, I will complete you, I'll fill your, the emptiness inside, I'll heal the pain, I'll settle the anxiety, I will feed your soul. I will satisfy you in a way that nothing else will. Let's go for a drink, shall we? I'm thirsty.